All right, so first off, I want to say happy Palm Sunday. I've mentioned it a couple times during the service that today is Palm Sunday, which means next week is Easter, which means this week is Passion Week. Um, this is a particularly good week to spend time considering the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus went through and what that means for His body, His church, this church, for you, for your family. It's a good week to just slow down and consider the sacrifice that was made on your behalf. Today we're going to finish Hebrews chapter 13. This is the last chapter of the book, so today we'll be done with Hebrews 13. Next week uh, I'll have an Easter message, and the week after that we're going to start 1 Samuel. In order to prepare for that, I would recommend reading through the book of Judges. You know, it's a light read. Um, if you'd like some commentary or to listen to some messages about that, we did record a message series on Judges, I think in 2018, it was a couple years ago, but that's online on our website if you want to listen to that as you read through it. But read Judges leading into 1 Samuel, it's a good reminder of the climate of Israel going into that book. But Hebrews, the, I, the main idea of the entire book is that if you believe God, and if you believe that Christ is supreme over all things, then you should order your life around that belief. The author spent the first nine, ten chapters arguing for the supremacy of Jesus over all things, and then there's this pivot in 10, 11, 12, 13, and it is essentially how do you um, order your life around what you believe? If these things about Christ are true, if he is supreme over all things, then you believe that. By faith, you believe these things that God is saying about himself and who Jesus is, then what do you do in your life today about that? How do you order your life around that belief? Um, and last week we talked about, in Hebrews 12, this idea that ordering your life looks kind of like a race. There were these three pictures. There was a race, a family, um, and then this picture of a shaking. And the author is saying, if you want to consider how to order your life around faith and this supremacy of Jesus, you can think of it in those three terms. Those pictures were very helpful, but today in Hebrews 13, he's going to get very specific. So rather than the pictures, today he's just going to give us commands. What does it look to look, excuse me, what does it look like to order your life around belief and faith in God? If you say that, man, I believe what he says about these things, and what do I do about it today? He's not going to give us any pictures, he's going to give us explicit examples. And all these examples are written in an imperative verb sense, meaning they are, in essence, commands to us. So with that in mind, let's go to the text. We're going to go Hebrews 13. I'm going to read the first six verses. We'll pause and then reflect. Hebrews 13, 1 says this. It says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as those in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? All right, so he just starts off with some light commands before I guess we get into the heavy stuff. You know, he's just kind of covering things like sexuality and money and hospitality. But essentially what he's saying here is in keeping with the same exhortation from the previous two chapters, let your faith order your life what does ordering your faith look like? If you say you believe these things about God, what do you do in your life today? For example, if you say that you believe that God is making a people for himself, that this thing that we're doing, this church thing, it's, it's not just like 
a social gathering. We're not just hanging out and kind of getting to see each other once a week and then going out and living our lives however we want. But we really, really believe that what he's doing in moments like this is he's forging a family for himself that's going to spend eternity together. If you really believe that, then how do you order your life? How do you respond? What do you do in light of that belief? Verse 1, continue in brotherly love. If you really believe that God is making a family, then you start treating the people in that family like family. Continue in brotherly love. Here's another one. If you really believe that God is forming this family out of all manner and nature of people, that the people that he is calling into his family, unbelievers, people out in the world, if you really believe that, then you need to, in order to if, if, if that's your belief, in order to order your life around that belief, then by faith you start treating strangers with hospitality because some of those strangers might become part of the family. It's interesting the way he frames that, isn't it? And then he throws this last one in there, because some have entertained angels unawares. That's a callback to the story in Genesis 18 through 19, where Abraham has three visitors one day. Turns out two of them are angels and one of them is the Lord. What he's asking is for the people of God to live in such a way that we are incredibly peculiar with the way we treat each other and the way we treat the world, strangers. We don't look so much like the world that people can't tell the difference between us. We're the kind of people who have time for those weird knocks on our door for that person that wants to take a moment to tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh man, I'd love to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. But we order our lives in such a way that we don't have any margin for strangers. Our lives are packed so full, we are so comfortable that there is no space to be hospitable because we're always in a hurry. But that isn't the character of our Father, is it? He's not in a hurry. He's patient. He's kind. He's got this thing called long-suffering. And so what the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, if you're going to count yourself among this family, you better believe that you've got to treat this family with brotherly love and you've got to treat the stranger with hospitality because they might become part of the family. They might actually be part of the family and you don't know it, so hospitality is what we always lead with, not suspicion. If you believe that God defines the parameters for sexuality, that he is the one who authored it, he's the one who created it, he's the one who decide what sexuality is, if you really believe that, then the way you order your life around that is to submit to the way that he says sexuality works. If you really believe that he is the one who created that thing, the way it works and how it's supposed to function, then the way we submit to that by faith is trust that he understands things about that that we maybe we don't understand. And therefore, we submit ourselves to those ways. So just for a brief moment, what are those things? Well, he calls out two, that God will judge the sexually immoral and that he will judge the adulterous. Now, it's interesting to me because the adulterous person is being sexually immoral, but he calls out two areas here. And the reason why he's calling out two areas is because he's trying to clearly define for believers what it looks like to function within the context of trusting that God knows what is good for his creation when it comes to sexuality and how we submit to those things. And he gave us, a it is not complicated, he gave us a very simple understanding of that, and it is marriage. That's it. Period. End of sentence. That's how creation functions well when it comes to sexuality. Within the context of marriage, 
What is marriage? We're given that marriage is between a man and a woman. That's it. There are no other things that we can invent that would go back and change the way that he, the creator, set up how his creation is supposed to function and thrive. Therefore, here's, this is as simple as it can get. Anything, when it comes to sexuality, that is outside of the explicit instructions of the creator, that marriage between a man and a woman is the only boundaries that this aspect of relationship function, anything that's not that is sin. You have to repent of it and turn to the creator. Okay, got it. What about, there's no what about. I don't care if in 90 years from now we come up with some kind of unbelievably new perverted description of what sexuality, it doesn't matter how many thousands of ways we try to create new things. There's one boundary, there's one definition, and he says that anything that isn't that is sin. And if you want to become part of my family, repent and turn from it. Do you believe that God cares for you and will never leave you? Do you believe that our God is the kind of God who looks out for his people and meets all of their needs? Then live content. He kind of covers everything there, doesn't he? For those of us that have the slants in modern society, we're like, well, let's not let the Bible touch kind of sexuality. Or we're always talking about this kind of stuff with sexuality, but we're never talking about greed. We're not talking about, no, no, he talks about it all. He's going to cover every bit of it, hospitality, sexuality, contentment, money, all of it. There is not a single area of your life that is untouched by the grace and commands of Jesus. And so he's saying, if you believe that you serve a God who loves you and cares for you and looks out for you, then the way you order your life today is to start living content. Stop fixing your eyes on the next most expensive thing and live content. Now, the New American Standard has a very interesting way that it translates it. I actually like it better than the ESV, which is what I'm reading from today. The New American Standard in 13.5 says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. I really like that translation because it calls out from the Greek this idea that what's being struggled with here is not just possessions. It's a character slant towards being a money slave. That the command is not just you can't have anything. The command is that stuff wants to own you. And the more you chase it, the more you play with fire. And so therefore, like how do you order your life against that thing that is a very real monster that wants to trap you regularly? That idea that whatever you have isn't enough, that you've got to chase more and better and newer and faster and more expensive for whatever reason. To satisfy your own longing, your own sadness, to prove things to other people because you didn't grow up with these things, to put yourself in society as a status symbol. It doesn't matter what the motivation is. All of these things lead to the same goal. They want to own you. The end game is you being a slave to this stuff. And so what does the writer of Hebrews tell us? What's the medicine against that? Live content. Look out your window and say, this is enough. That wasn't just kind of like a, like kind of a throwaway. That is something that I'm, I'm giving to you as a habit that I'd love for you to cultivate in your own life. Because none of us are immune to this. I'm not immune to this. I'm not immune to that desire to want to get the next thing to advance, to buy, to be placed in, to be seen as. Nobody's immune to it. So how do you remind your soul that, that you believe that a God who loves you is caring for you and taking care of you? You make a habit of doing this one thing. I'm telling you, practice this. When you go home today, Stand like an old man looking out your front door, just surveying your property, and say out loud, this is enough. 
When you're driving down the road in your car, looking out at your city, say this, this is enough. You will be amazed at what that one simple sentence does to your soul. You're preaching to yourself, and it's good for you. And all of these commands are rooted in what you believe. If you believe these big things of God, about God, then you order your life around things that look like love and hospitality and honoring your marriage and living content. So let's look at a few more. Go to Hebrews 13, we'll go to 7, and then we'll read 8. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate them. Now, he's going to tell us again down in verse 17 to obey our leaders, but he's using this word leaders in the sense that who he's talking about here in verse 7 is not the people he's talking about in verse 17. The people he's talking about in verse 7, when he says imitate their faith, this is a call back to Hebrews 11. He's saying, remember the people who came before you, the leaders of the faith. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, the ones who recorded. Remember remember Isaiah? Read his book. Remember what he spoke to you. Remember the word of God. Consider the outcome of the way of their life and imitate their faith, Hebrews 11. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And among those leaders who demonstrated what it looks like to live and run an endurance of life, Jesus Christ is the chief of those. So what is ordering your life around what you believe look like? Well, first, it looks like remembering your leaders outlined in Hebrews 11. They gave us a framework for how we're supposed to live. And what the author is telling us to do is if you believe that God is the God who saves people and uses their life as examples and models for us to follow, then don't ignore those models and examples when we are in the habit of ordering our lives on a daily basis. So what does it look like to live as a follower of God? We'll read 1 Samuel Follow the way that David followed God. He's a great example. Look at Samuel, the prophet. Look at Abraham. Look at Moses. Look at Gideon. These were men who gave examples with their very own lives. And the author is saying, if you want to order your life around your belief system in God, then don't forget these people who set examples for you. And the greatest example was Jesus. So in, so if you believe God, how do you order your life? Well, one of the ways you order your life is you look at people who came before you who lived a life like yours, and you follow their examples. And the greatest example of this is Jesus. This is the reason why I had us memorize Philippians 2, 5 through 7 this week. Because he was in the form of God but did not choose equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took the form of a servant. So if one of the greatest examples of leaders to follow is Jesus, then what example did he set? He set the example of taking the form of a servant. So the question is, what form are you taking? But then he has this last one. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not just the greatest example, but his example is timeless. Now hear me. The way he outlined how to live a life in obedience to God is an example that's worth following, and it's timeless. It's not tied to the first century, meaning the examples he set weren't good all the way up to the 1500s, They held true in the 1800s. They held true the 1900s. And then in 1960, when the sexual revolution started, things needed to be reassessed. 
the stuff, the, the examples he set, we, well, we've got to reassess some things now. It wasn't good all the way from the time of Jesus when he set the examples right up until the birth of the internet, and then everyone got connected in weird ways, and we got manipulated by social media, and now the ways that he taught us in order to live, they're different now because he didn't have internet back then, and they weren't connected in ways that we are now, and so the things that they have to say about, about sexuality, for example, or, or, or connection, or hospitality, it's just different. No. He's the greatest example of all time, and his examples are timeless. You're not going to lose modeling your life after these people of faith and Christ. Therefore, don't be led astray when arguments come out today that the examples are no longer relevant. That's where we pick up in verse 9. Hebrews 13, 9 says, do not be led away by diverse teachings and, excuse me, by diverse and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those who devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Now, you, you were like, okay, I was tracking with him in 1 through 7, and now he's off the rail. I have no idea what he's talking about. Like, you had me, and then you didn't have me. I'll explain where he's going with this, but essentially what he's doing is he's dipping back into the stuff from Hebrews uh, like 8 through 10, where he's pulling and he's drawing on the illustration of the temple and the tabernacle. And he's, he's referencing, we're not familiar with that structure, but he's referencing something that the priests did regularly, and he's using that as an illustration to help us understand the way we should be ordering our lives today. And he's, and he's using that illustration as a command, don't get caught up in diverse teaching, strange teachings. Don't get caught up by somebody who says the way of Christ isn't good in this situation. I've got a better idea. The, the commands of God go just up to this point, and then I've got a better idea from this point forward because the Bible is silent on these issues. Don't, don't fall for it. And here's the reason why we don't fall for it. He's giving this illustration. Verse 11, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So, all right, pause right there. So the last two, verse 15 and 16, we'll get to in a moment because those are really, those are rich. I could preach a whole message series on just those two verses, but we've got to kind of dissect this illustration he's talking about. So what he's talking about in 9 through about 14 is a callback to the old ways. Now, when I say old ways, I'm talking in Hebrews 8 through 10 sense of old ways. When the author was saying, okay, there was an old way of doing things, an old covenant. It had a tabernacle, it had priests, it had furniture. You guys are familiar with this. There was this, there was a table of showbread, there was a sacrifice. Well, among this entire system and the furniture and the priests and the sacrifices, there was a habit that the priests had that he's referencing here. And the habit that he's calling out is in Exodus 29 through 26, excuse me, 29, 26, and Leviticus 6, 16 through 18. The idea being that the priests, when, when somebody, let's say that you brought a sacrifice to the temple or to the tabernacle for your family, the priests, they don't have land, they don't raise sheep, they don't, they don't plant. So how do priests feed their family? Well, they feed their family off the sacrifice. So if you bring a sacrifice to cover the sins of your family, the priests offer that sacrifice, and then all the priests gather around when the sacrifice is done and you've gone home. The priests feast off of that sacrifice. They gather around the altar, they eat of it, they have an old barbecue. They're feasting off of that sacrifice because it's now covered the sins, and the point now is to feed the priests. They're feasting off of that sacrifice. Whatever was not eaten from that sacrifice was then taken outside and burned and buried. 
taken outside of the tabernacle. So what the author of Hebrews is saying is that church, you guys, that have a desire to want to continue, not you guys, but the Hebrews church, that has a desire to constantly go back to those old Jewish ways, to go back to the tabernacle, back to the temple. Don't you know that the altar that you have been given, this is verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Don't you know that we as Christians, we have a better altar than the altar that they're feasting off of? And that's when he starts drawing on this ritual that the priests had. So he's saying in the same way that the tabernacle priests had this altar where they would feast and gather around and they'd celebrate and they'd enjoy each other's company and they would, they would eat and feed themselves, feed their families off of this altar. Don't you know that you Christians also have an altar that these priests don't have the right to eat from? Why don't they have the right to eat from it? Because in the same way that when they were done eating, some of the, the, the sacrifice they didn't want to consume, so they took it outside of the tabernacle and buried it, that is a type of Christ. Christ was a sacrifice that the priests didn't want to consume. That's why he was sacrificed outside of the tabernacle or the temple. He was sacrificed outside the city because the priests at the time, the high priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of Israel, they did not want to consume him as a sacrifice that was made once for all. So if we have a Christ that the priest didn't want to feast on, and he's taken outside, then outside the city, outside of the tabernacle, outside of that entire system, that's where we go. That's where we spend our time. Not here among the priests who can't even feast among that other altar. We are outside that tabernacle with Christ, feasting on his body that the, that the high priests and the people of Israel didn't want anything to be, they didn't want any part of that. Do you understand the illustration now? It's powerful, isn't it? The way he uses it, he's a master of using these illustrations and these types and shadows to say big things about our God. And the thing he's saying is that what Christ did, in essence, is give us a new altar to celebrate around. But he didn't just give us a new altar. Outside of that altar um, is a place where, where we're feasting off of him. But we're not just feasting off of him. We're sharing in the joy and the suffering with him. See, at this altar, the priests, they're gathering around. Hey, Joseph, come on over here. Abraham, let's, let's feast. Let's eat. You don't want any part of that. That's the old system that's currently passing away. What you want is to be feasting with your brothers in Christ outside on the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. You want to be out there with him where he suffered. You want to be out there suffering with him, enjoying communion out there with him. You don't want to be counted among those who didn't want any part of his sacrifice. So out there, is where we share at his altar. Out there is where we're sharing in the sacrifices and the joys. But out there is something really fascinating. This is where he gets to 15 and 16. Out there, we are sharing in new sacrifices. Now, to me, this is kind of revolutionary. It may, be not be, it, it, it may not be new, but it kind of is revolutionary when you think about it. What the author of Hebrews is saying in verses 15 and 16 is that we no longer have sacrifices that count for atonement. We don't need to offer animals to cover our own sins anymore. Our sins have been covered. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the idea of sacrifice have passed. There is still in Christianity this concept of sacrifices, but it doesn't look anything like it did before, but it also kind of does look like it did before a little bit. You following? So you're not bringing animals and shedding blood anymore. The only, the only blood that needed to be shed was Christ. Instead, we offer new, different sacrifices. Verse 15, through them let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. Oh, okay. So now praise is a sacrifice that we offer. You don't come to church and bring a lamb 
And then someone's going to slaughter it over on the side, and we're going to do stuff with the blood. All the atonement sacrifices have been covered, but it doesn't mean we don't still bring sacrifices. What are the sacrifices that we bring today out there among Christ? It is a sacrifice of praise that is brought. What am I doing? I can't read that. That is brought with the fruit of your own lips. Why do we gather and sing? Because it is a sacrifice that you bring to your king. That's why sometimes you're like, well, I don't like this song. I don't want to sing it. Okay. I mean, that's fine. I, I'm not going to argue with you. But there is a precedent that your refusing to sing is a refusal to bring a sacrifice before your king. Because we're told that in this new structure, there's a way that we bring sacrifices that you don't define, that he has defined, and one of the ways that he defines it is the fruit of your lips. You bring a sacrifice of praise. It doesn't end there, verse 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, because that is a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. So what is one of the ways that you order your life around this new altar that he's created? If you believe these big things about Christ, then you stop bringing sacrifices that looked like sacrifices under the old covenant and you bring these new sacrifices and you bring them faithfully. What does it look like to order my life around faith in God? It looks like me singing in church. It looks like me singing in my car. It looks like me sharing the things that God has given me with other people who don't have them or might need them. Isn't that fascinating? The way that the author has taken that concept of sacrifice and redefined it to help us understand the value of sacrifice in our life today. That the, fact, that, that the sheer fact that you chose to do good is a sacrifice to your father. The fact that you chose to open your mouth. Uh, man, I don't know what's going on, but man, like the Holy Spirit is moving in this church in worship. Like we don't need a choir because all of y'all are the choir. I can't believe how loud you guys have been singing, but that is a perfect illustration of what I'm talking about. When you sing out, what you're doing is offering a sacrifice of praise from the fruit of your lips. It's almost like your mouth is a garden. It's producing good fruit, and you're offering that fruit to the Lord as a sacrifice. That's Hebrews. And that's why we sing. Let's go to verse 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you sooner. So we're back at the exhortations of ordering our lives. If you believe that God has established this family and he has brought this thing called authority into our lives, that everyone is under authority, that there are structures in place in our life where we willfully and joyfully submit to folks that this idea of authority is something that God has established. If you believe that, then obey your leaders. Now, the author is assuming that the leaders here in question are godly and caring for your soul kind of leaders. This is not a command to sit under a wicked leader or a false prophet or to stay in a church that abuses you or takes advantage of you. He's talking about leaders who keep watch and care over your souls, not treat you like a commodity and try to fleece you. So the command is to order your life around leaders in such a way that it is a joy for those leaders to lead you. It should be a joy for the leaders to lead you because of the way that you function within the body. So one of the ways that you order your life is to obey your leaders. The other way you order your life, he tells us in verse 18, you pray for your leaders. Do you believe that God is working his purposes through the local church? Then pray for the local church. So this is his exhortation. 
Ordering your life around faith looks like two big things. One, obeying your leaders. But that word obey really means trust the example that they set. It doesn't mean that the leader walks around with a hammer and just smacks everything that kind of looks like a nail. Leadership means servanthood. It means setting the example. And therefore, the people follow the leaders in the church who are setting the example that Christ has set. So Christ sets example. The leaders are the ones among the family who God has called over them to set the example Christ has set so that the people have an example to follow and contextualize the gospel. Not that the people don't follow Christ, they do, but it helps a local body to be able to say, all right, I see that there's a biblical command to love my children, but I don't really know what that looks like when my children are so hard to love. By God's grace, he puts leaders in your life who love their children, you can say, oh, that's what it looks like. Do you see the example? He sets up the structure and he says, I've given leaders in order to bless my people so they have examples to follow just like they did in Hebrews 11. But it is not an easy thing to be an example to follow when a leader says, follow me as I follow Christ. That is, it is incredibly difficult. And so church, pray for your leaders so that they are a good example because it's not easy. See the dynamic that's at work here? He has set up a structure because he loves his people, that there are people that you can, un, if, if, if this text is confusing or if this thing doesn't make sense, there are people that can guide you, lead you, you can talk to, you can share with, you can cry on their shoulder, they can set examples for you, but being that example is incredibly difficult, so pray for them that they are, in fact, good examples. This entire section is fascinating to me because it, shed it sheds light on the dynamics of the local church. It shows us how a healthy church has leaders who follow Christ and set a servanthood example. And then the church in turn sees that example and in joy follows it. And in this model, nobody is exploited and everyone has an abundance of examples to follow. The problem we have in the church today is that we don't have pastors who are pastoring people. We have pastors who are being celebrities. Or we have pastors as CEOs. Or we have pastors as fundraisers. Or we have pastors as event coordinators. We have pastors as ship captains. Or, or heads over armies. We don't have pastors who are pastoring the people and modeling what it looks like to follow Christ. We have pastors functioning in every vocation that you could possibly imagine with the title of pastor, but not pastor. And then it bleeds down into the church. And we have churches functioning as everything but the church. We have churches functioning as country club. We have churches functioning as um, tech startups. We have churches functioning as retirement homes. But we don't have churches functioning as churches. And so Hebrews is helpful to us because it, it reorients us to what we should be doing in the first place. And it helps us understand that in God's good design, leaders are servants. And if the people follow the servants, then you've got nothing but a church full of servants. And that's where we can start getting some stuff done. Let's go to verse 20. This is where he finishes. He says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be God, excuse me, to whom be glory forever and ever and a amen. And then his final greetings of the letter, I appeal to you brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. For I have written to you briefly. I, I don't know if I'd say that. <laughs> 
you should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints, those who come from Italy, send you greetings. Grace be with you all. So the author closes his letter with a powerful prayer and helpful clues about his audience. His audience is, um, it, it was prayer, is that God would equip them and work through them. He also speaks of Timothy, which lets us know that this this writer is probably in Paul's circle. And we're also told that he is um, giving a shout out to all of the leaders from Italy, which means that this church is probably located somewhere near Rome. But to close today's message and this series, my attention is drawn to verse 22. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. Bear with my word of exhortation. That word bear with means to endure, which is fascinating because that's the word that we keep touching on this entire book. Bear with or endure my exhortation. That word exhortation is a word that means encouragement. So the author's goal is that this church endures through the encouragement. Now, I don't know if I'd describe it that way. I don't know how many times I've ever had to endure through someone's encouragement. You think about that, like having to stand there and, and listen to somebody just encourage you. That's not something that we would classify as something that you have to endure through. But this guy's encouragement isn't the kind of encouragement that you get at the door when you show up to church. No, this, in, this guy's encouragement feels like somebody Somebody whipped you. Somebody disciplined you. Somebody put you in your place. Somebody encouraged you to think differently about the way that your life has been functioning. And so he says, I want you to endure through this because, here's the big thing, it isn't something that happens one time. The reason why we have this book is because the encouragement that we have to endure through is to go back and, and read this over and over and over again. The series is done, but the book isn't done speaking into your life. Because what's going to happen is after this is done and we move on with our lives, hard things are going to come. And he's going to discipline you and you're not going to want to listen to it. And he's going to try and train you, and you're going to ignore him. And suffering is going to come into your life, and you're going to want to whine about it rather than endure through it. And so the last word that the author gives us is that his desire for this church and for our church is that you endure through the encouragement, that you keep, <clears throat> you keep believing these things that God says about himself and therefore arrange your life around it. That during this series, you may have heard him speak on one thing, and, and it was kind of revolutionary, and you're like, okay, this means big things. i got to change a lot of stuff in my life, so I'm going to go home, I'm going to rearrange, and it may take six months, eight months to actually start ordering your life around that thing that you believe, and your, your temptation is going to be like, oh, that was exhausting. Okay, but good. Now I'm good. Now I'm good. Now, now, I'm, now I'm fine. And then all of a sudden, he's going to want to show you the next thing that he wants to kind of hone off of your rough edges. And you're going to be like, oh, we got to start over? Yeah, we do got to start over because it's time to endure. Because every time you think that you've got one thing licked, there are 93 things standing in line for him to start focusing your attention on. And you're like, oh, God, that's not what I signed up for. Somebody just said, raise your hand, pray a prayer, and then I'd be fine. Well, I hate to tell you, but somebody sold you a false gospel. Jesus loves you too much to say, just say these words and I got you. No, there is a sanctification process where he is going to soften that hard exterior. He's going to take that heart of stone and he's going to make it like clay and he's going to keep working on you and he's going to keep working on you and he's going to use people you don't like to say things you need to hear and it's not ever going to stop but it's for your good and for his glory and so this is the last word as we finish today church endure in the encouragement let's pray mm -hmm.